comes across as very friendly, empathetic, attentive, calm, and focused on what he's doing. You can sense that this man carries knowledge that can and already does ensure the survival of millions of people. He's called the Forest Maker and has been awarded the Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize for this. What makes him special is that he doesn't plant trees. Instead, a different way of making trees grow again was revealed to him. We are very happy to introduce Tony Rinaldo to you. Hello, dear Tony. Greetings to Australia. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so, um, Tony, could you tell us what you're working on right now? Yes, definitely. So World Vision Australia has initiated a campaign to restore 1 billion hectares of degraded land globally. And even though World Vision is a very large organisation, we know that we cannot achieve this alone. So we, we will work with others and we'll work through others. My role is the ambassador or the spokesperson for the movement. So I'm very busy at the moment doing podcasts, uh, meeting government entities, other non-government organisations and donors, and enlisting their help and, and getting them on board with the movement. Mm -hmm. Very important role we play. <laughs> yeah. Your life has taken such an extraordinary path to you probably would never have expected, right? So you, you might be surprised, but my, my answer is both yes and no, mm -hmm. uh, to the degree that right from childhood, I, I love trees. I had a special fascination for Africa. In, in one sense, it's no surprise. I, I guess when I look at the degree of interest from around the world and the support that's coming in, yes, yes, it's wonderful, the developments and um, the progress that's being made. So th this is a wonderful surprise. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. you are always well guided, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. So since you started your work, you have become now worldwide known as the forest maker. Also, thanks to the excellent documentary by Volker Schlöndorf. And maybe let's start at the point that was fateful for you. Um, you came across a book and that was written by the tree activist Richard St. Barb Baker. Could you tell us a bit more about that moment? Yes, so at, at the time when I was growing up, I was deeply impacted by observing the deforestation going on in my own district, but also I, I read widely and um, I, I was very aware that this was a global problem, but I, I felt frustrated. I felt angry because I didn't know how to change things. And I, I felt even if adults weren't directly doing this damage, there weren't, I, I wasn't aware of people opposing it. Mm -hmm. And so I had a very negative view of the adult world, that they didn't care about the environment or they were outright destroying it. And then one day I was traveling to a farm with my father. He, he was a, a machinery mechanic and um, he, he had a, a garage um, machinery shop. And he was visiting one of his friends. Mm -hmm. And it, it was the off season, so the man's uh, agricultural shed was cleared. But in the middle of this shed on the floor, he, he dumped a whole trailer load of books. Mm -hmm. He'd gone to a library clearance sale and bought bought everything that was there and just dumped them in his shed. And I, I loved reading. I, I was fascinated about the things happening around the world. And so I, I walked around this pile of books and there were two books. There was no cover on them, just a dull green colour, nothing to particularly attract me. But it was as if they leapt out. And they were by this, this uh, forester and author, Richard St. Barb Baker. I planted trees and Sahara Conquest. And I, I borrowed those books and I read them from cover to cover several times. <laughs> and the, the first thing that struck me was that not all adults are destroying the world, <laughs> that there are some that are actively um, promoting restoration and, and sensible forest management. 
And the second thing was I, I thought for the first time, perhaps this is a model that I could follow. I, maybe this is something that I could do with my yeah. life. So it, his yeah. writing had a very big influence on me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so you are a really very famous and great expert. Perhaps, please, could you answer this question? Why are trees so important for survival? What do they do for us? Actually, I, I can't put it more eloquently than the, the words of my hero, Richard St. Barb Baker. So please bear with me. I'm just going to read a short passage yes. from okay. one of his yes. books. And he, he wrote, We had better be without gold than without timber. Wood is necessary to civilize life, and therefore it is the basis of civilization. The greatest value of trees is probably their beneficent effect upon life, health, climate, soil, rainfall, and streams. Mm. Trees beautify the country, provide shade for humans and stock, shelter crops from wind and storm, and retain water in the soil at a level at which it can be used by man. And this next short paragraph, this was what really struck me. Mm. The neglect of forestry in the past has accounted for the deserts that exist, because of the fact that when the tree covering disappears from the earth, the water level sinks. When the forests go, the waters go. The fish and game go. Crops go. Herds and flocks go. Fertility departs. Then the age-old phantoms appear stealthily, one after another. Flood, drought, fire. Uh, uh, drought, sorry, flood. Drought, fire, famine, pestilence. And those words pierced me in the heart. And, and to, if I was to summarize and answer your question, life on earth as we know it would be impossible without trees. Yeah. And living trees, apparently. Because uh, you know, oh, yeah. people cut <laughs> wood to make furniture and everything, which is also important. But he speaks of, you know, living trees that bring shadow. And yes. Yes, I, I have no problem with utilizing trees, but it's important to do this sustainably and to all, always ensure that there's adequate tree cover on the land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I would like to go to the beginning again when you went to the Republic of Niger with your family in the early 80s. Um, what did you find there and what did you see as your task there? Certainly. So uh, we were, my wife and I were very young. We were new graduates from university. We'd studied agriculture and so very little experience. When we landed in Niger, the landscape that confronted us uh, was shocking. It was on the point of ecological collapse and barely able to support life. Even though in my lifetime, I was 24 years old at the time, this had been a biodiverse dryland forest. There was still wildlife, uh, flowing springs of water and fertile farms in the clearings. In just two short decades, most of the tree cover had been taken out. Uh, the fertile soil had become uh, desert waste. It was just sandy, infertile soil. The wildlife had certainly disappeared and the springs had dried up. So it, it, it was terrible. And because of that loss of tree cover and the bushes, th there was no habitat for natural predators of insect pests. So mm -hmm. even in the years when you had adequate rainfall, you still have no guarantee of growing enough food for your family because there would yes. be an explosion of insect pest problems and no insect-eating birds, lizards and spiders and so on nothing to balance that damage. So life was very, very hard. My role at the time, I, I walked into a pre-existing, uh, very small tree planting project. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea was if, if deforestation had caused many of the problems that people are suffering, poverty, regular hunger, and, and so on, then surely we need to get trees back in that landscape. This was all good and well, but it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't for lack of effort. 
um, I, I studied all the texts that I could get my hands on. I consulted experts. I experimented with different methods of planting, different species of trees from around the world, different timing to try and get success. Despite everything, practically 80% of the trees mm. died in that harsh environment. Mm -hmm. And to add insult to injury, the very people who we went to help called me the crazy white farmer. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can understand where they're coming from. Here they are, they're hungry, they're poor. Yeah. And this crazy guy comes and says, you need to devote some of your land to growing trees. So mm -hmm. that was my responsibility, managing a reforestation project. But I, I wasn't a very happy camper. <laughs> yeah. So and then there was a very special moment. You wanted to give up, I remember. And uh, then there was a special day, Volker Schlöndorf says about it. And then something happened that is called Revelation in the Bible. Can you describe this moment in more detail, please? Y yes, certainly. And remembering, I was quite young at that time, and there's this expectation of youth that you can solve the world's problems yesterday. <laughs> and it simply wasn't happening. So I was very discouraged. And it would have been quite easy to give up and go home. And I remember in particular one day I was driving, I uh, had a pickup truck and a trailer load of, loaded up with uh, tree seedlings ready to plant out in the villages. Knowing full well most of those trees would die and the people weren't interested. They didn't care about those trees. So it's very, very discouraging. But... I needed to stop the vehicle. The, the roads there, bush tracks are very sandy and you have to reduce the air pressure so mm -hmm. that you don't get bogged. Mm -hmm. And I, I did this feeling very discouraged and looking out over that barren landscape, hardly a tree to the horizon, thinking how many million dollars would it take? How many decades? How many hundred staff would you need to make a difference using these methods? And I, I knew it was impossible. So what, what to do? I, I guess um, I felt there must be a solution. Uh, I, I remember as a child I prayed for God to use me somehow, somewhere to make a difference. Mm -hmm. and, and I felt God doesn't make mistakes. There must be a solution. And, and so again I turned to prayer and just asked, first of all, to forgive us for destroying the gift of creation. And that destruction has caused all this suffering. People are hungry. People are poor. People are frightened. They don't know what the next day will bring. But I simply asked, show us what to do. Open our eyes. Help us. The amazing thing to me is that by this stage, I'd already been traveling on this track nearly every week for two and a half years. Eyes open but totally blind to what had been there the whole time. <laughs> Before I got back into the truck, this what seemed to be a bush caught my attention and I took the trouble to walk over and take a closer look. And I, I notice you've got a plant there behind you. Yeah. <laughs> the shape of the leaf of any plant is like a signature. It tells you what that plant is. As soon as I took a closer leaf, look at the leaf and I, I could see the shape, I realized it's not a bush, it's not a weed, that's a tree. Mm -hmm. And I, I bent over, I brushed away some of the sand and sure enough, there was a big tree stump. This had been a mature tree, it had been cut and the shoots were re-sprouting. Mm -hmm. And in that instant, for me, everything changed. Mm -hmm. I, I knew I'm not fighting the Sahara Desert. I don't need an enormous budget. Everything that I need is literally at my feet. Mm -hmm. And there are millions of these bushes across this bar what seems to be a barren landscape. I, I call it the underground forest. The yeah. forest is there, but it's unseen. Yeah. And from that moment, my whole approach shifted. It's not so much a technical issue, this is a behavioral issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, a uh, wonderful picture of the underground forest or trees. And um, faith, 
plays an important role in your life, doesn't it? Yes, yes, definitely. So I, I remember as a child, and I, I think I described a little bit of the, the anger and the frustration, the clearing of the bush in my own district and the awareness of what was happening globally. Plus, <laughs> the main crop in my home area was tobacco. And I was very aware. I used to read a lot. I used to watch the news even as a boy. There were children just like me who through no fault of their own were going to bed hungry. It just seemed so unjust. And But something that had a big impact on my life was my mum's quiet, gentle faith. Mm -hmm. And that gave me a framework for living. I understood there are more important things to life than financial security, that we do have a duty of care for those less fortunate than ourselves, and we are responsible to care for nature, to care for creation. Yes, use it. Yes, benefit from it, but not destroy it. Mm. So th this had a big impact on me. And I, I said this child's prayer, please use me somehow, somewhere to make a difference. And the same living in Africa, you, you're thrown into this unknown situation. You don't have the skills, the experience. You often make your own mistakes. There, there's opposition. There's difficulty after difficulty. The only thing left is is faith in God. God, you brought me here. Yeah. Help us. Yeah. Show us what to do. So it, it's played a very big role in my life. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would like to go um, back to this moment where you had this discovery, like in this what seems to be a desert, but then you discovered the stump in, in the earth. So could you describe a little bit more in detail this method that you somehow discovered or that you was revealed to you, which is called natural uh, farmer managed natural regeneration? You created that. Um, can you explain that to us? How can you make forests? <laughs> De definitely. So it's embarrassingly simple, actually, <laughs> but there's no i'm not ashamed because it works and it works mm. very very effectively at low cost and it's scalable many mm. landscapes around the world world that appear to be treeless if you look back in history sometimes in the recent past sometimes in the distant past many of these bare lands were forested And often, especially in developing countries where they don't have heavy machinery, often, even after decades, even sometimes after centuries, the tree stump is still alive. After And centuries. very often, even in the... Mm -hmm. Pardon? After centuries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And even in the absence of tree stumps, the seeds of many tree species are very resilient and they have a hard seed coast. They can lay dormant in the soil for, for decades, maybe longer, maybe even centuries, waiting for the right conditions to, to germinate. And so FMNR, Farmer Managed Natural Regeneration, involves selecting those amongst what you see there in the field. It might just look like bushes. Select the ones that you want to keep. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with tree stumps, there will be a mass of shoots coming from the one stump, mm -hmm. sometimes 20, 30, even 50 mm -hmm. stems mm -hmm. from one stump. So there's too much competition there. So this method involves reducing the excess. Let's select perhaps five of the tallest, the healthiest, strongest mm -hmm. stems, and cut away the rest so we reduce competition, remove some of the side branches, and then protect that growth. The protection, usually the kinds of things that prevent the, the trees and the seeds in the ground from becoming trees, people burn regularly. Every year they burn. People have continuous uh, grazing, overgrazing. When they plough their fields, they plough every square inch of the land. And in these countries, the main energy source for cooking and heating and even lighting is woody biomass. So they, they cut these, this regrowth out. 
So if we protect them from those threats, then the, the trees can come back very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, what costs a lot of time and energy is the persuasion work that you had to do and that still has to be done. What is the difficulty in convincing the local people for this form of agriculture or for agriculture at all? This is so really you, you a might big be question. surprised. Yeah. yeah. And, um, f funnily enough, I don't actually convince anybody of anything. I ask <laughs> probing questions and people convince themselves. And you, you are quite right. Um, it can be very difficult and time consuming. I mentioned people called me the crazy white farmer. This was a, a silly idea in their minds. Hmm. Some farmers said to me, Tony, maybe my grandchildren will benefit. Maybe my children, but I never will. The thought being that trees take decades and decades to grow. And remember, these people were hungry today. They needed yeah. rapid results. Mm. And, and then thirdly, there's a belief, trees shade crops. Trees will cause my crops and, and pastures to, to not grow so well. So there was a genuine fear. How do I do it? <laughs> So I've run these workshops in many, many countries now, perhaps 30 countries. And what I recognize in every country, every culture, parents desire a better future for their children mm. than the current reality that they're experiencing. And so I simply ask questions. If you continue business as usual, destroying the forest, destroying the environment, What will life be like for yourself and your children? And while it's true, many, many of the people I work with haven't got an a education or they only have primary school education, they're by no means silly. <laughs> they understand what's happening. Yeah. And they describe what will happen if they continue destroying the environment. And then I can say, oh, that's not very nice, is it? Nobody wants to suffer even more than they are now. And I invite them, would you come on a journey with me? Let's experiment, not on your whole land, because people are naturally risk averse. Just mm -hmm. pick a small corner of your land mm -hmm. and let's see what happens within one year. If you like it, then we can continue. And if you don't, heaven forbid, <laughs> they're your trees, it's your land, you can cut them out. I only need that one year. The trees grow so fast and the benefits are so significant that people convince themselves very quickly. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow, in one year. In Is one it really year? that in yeah. one year you, can, you have a tree? That well, you, you won't have a large tree, but you will start to benefit. And so some of these trees uh, are putting fertility back in the soil, either organic matter or some of them mm -hmm. are nitrogen fixing their, their legumes and they put nitrogen into the soil. Um, they, from the pruning, they provide a small amount of fuel wood. And in many cases, the women and children are walking three to four hours every second day just to collect fuel mm -hmm. wood. When they do this mm -hmm. close to the village, it reduces that burden even in the first year. Many of these trees have edible fruits, nuts, leaves. Some of them make excellent fodder for livestock and, and so on. So in the first year, the benefit will be small, but it's significant enough that it catches people's attention. And a number of people, a critical mass of people say, wow, it, it didn't do any harm. I'm going to take this experiment another year and see where it takes me. Yeah. <laughs> great. Wow. Really great. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, could you tell us how many hectares like, of land and in how many African countries have you been able to reforest? Do you have a number for us? So uh, through World Vision alone, we've introduced the, this approach into 29 countries. <laughs> And we've also promoted it to other governments, to other non-government organizations and individuals. So it, I, I don't have an exact number, but I can say that in Niger Republic alone, there are over six million hectares 
of formerly degraded land that now contains over 240 million trees wow. without planting a single one of them. Wow. That's <laughs> absolutely fascinating. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow, and the and forest this, yeah. maker. <laughs> yeah, and this method. Now it comes to my mind. This method is really is it, it? It's really simple. It's what every gardener does every year. Like they cut the, you know, these sprouts that go everywhere. They cut them off, so the trees goes, become stronger. Actually, you're absolutely right. There's nothing new about this. I didn't invent some great new method. It's actually a historical method going back centuries in, in Germany, in other parts of the world, even in Africa. But for one reason or, or another, we've lost the, the skill and, and the habit of doing this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So um, the good thing is that now it's becoming increasingly clear that you can earn money with trees. So the magic word would be CO2 certificates. How does that work? Well, f first of all, I'd like to say that the biggest benefits are direct. Some of those things that I already listed, wild foods, fertilizer, and so on. And, and this is the message that I take to farmers. Don't wait for some external agency to discover you and to pay you for doing this. This should be done Anyway, so I, I just wanted to make that point. But as trees grow, they naturally absorb carbon dioxide, in, and it's it's becomes part of the part of the wood and the leaf material and so on. In Western countries, polluting companies which cannot meet emissions reductions targets can buy what's called carbon credits, mm. and in effect, they they're able to pay farmers and uh, communities to grow trees on their land. And as long as certain um, requirements are met, that there's monitoring, that there's verification every year that the trees are there, that they're growing, and certain rules and regulations are met, as long as that continues, those farmers can be eligible for annual payments. So it, it is a great benefit to people uh, on, on both sides. There's benefit to the companies, but certainly a, a great benefit to the people growing the trees. You can't do this work not alone. Um, you have important partners at your side. What role does World Vision play in this? So, so certainly, um, I'm, I'm a member of World Vision, a, a staff mm -hmm. member. Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, I'd say that the people doing the FMNR work are the farmers and communities themselves. Mm -hmm. So those millions of hectares that I mentioned, that's not Tony that did that. It's, it's the communities and the individuals on their own land. But in many cases, it's the World Vision frontline staff who create awareness who teach the method, who are there uh, hand-holding in a sense when there's problems, they're troubleshooting, they're encouraging, uh, they're backstopping the farmers until they're standing on their own feet. And, and then in the broader sense, um, behind those frontline workers, there are fundraisers, there's people working in advocacy to, to try and convince governments for more favourable policies. Uh, there are media people, administrators, and so on. So I'm, I'm very blessed, really. World Vision works in 100 countries, mm -hmm. and uh, we work right down to the village level. So it's given me such reach and such support to spread this idea globally. It's just wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> that's really that's great. That's amazing. A big, big gift. We need it all. <laughs> we need it all, yeah. Um, yes. I would like to talk about one sentence that you say in the in Volker <laughs> Schlündorf's film. <laughs> you say that Africa is such a big continent that it could actually feed the world. How? So people, people are surprised when they hear that statement. And honestly, I, I don't know if I'm exaggerating or not. I don't believe that I am. But consider... Libya, this what is today a desert country, used to be the, the granary of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And much of Africa today is degraded. The farmlands have been farmed for decades and centuries 
without rejuvenation. So the production on these lands is very, very low. Most farmers in Africa, at, in this day and age, are still using handheld tools. Mm -hmm. It's very inefficient, it's yeah. very slow, and if you cannot get your seed in on time, when, when the rains come, you need to get that seed in quick. Otherwise, the yield will be lower if, if you're late in planting. If you don't cultivate the weeds quickly, they will choke out the crop. And again, that leads to yield reduction. Um, I mentioned degraded, depleted soils. Very few farmers in Africa access either modern fertilizers or even animal manure. So the soil is very infertile. And even though Africa has so many water resources, irrigation is barely developed, or I, I'd like to say appropriate irrigation, because <laughs> some types of irrigation can be quite damaging. But it, it's hardly utilised. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, at least 25% of the grain harvest is lost in storage mm. to mould, to insects yeah. and so on. So, so when we introduce FMNR, right there you can double crop yields, admittedly from a very low starting point, but just by starting to work with nature instead of opposing it, mm -hmm. we can already double crop yields. And then on top of that, if we're able to bring in improved seed, appropriate irrigation, some level of mechanization, uh, uh, workable grain storage to, to cut back all of that loss, better transport systems, and importantly, fair prices for the farmers, then I, I don't think it's an exaggeration. Certainly Africa could feed itself. Certainly mm -hmm. it could feed other countries, if not the whole world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a shame that it's not done, actually. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, what you just said, all of that, it could be done, but nothing's happening. This this is oh, this is the it. tragedy. We don't have to invent some new technology, or it, it's not something we haven't already done. Many of these things were discovered and developed decades and decades ago. Mm. We're talking about basic, basic things that, first of all, could feed people in Africa, but secondly, could result in a surplus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can the Earth? still be saved in the face of climate change? What do you mean? So I believe yes, but the time is very short. We've had so many warnings and we have to act very, very quickly on all areas. It's essential to stop ongoing emissions as quickly as possible. Yeah. We can't continue doing what we're doing, adding more CO2 to the atmosphere. In, in, in my area of work, FMNR, we would call this a nature-based solution. Mm. Now, the tragedy here is that it, it's been estimated that 30% of the problem of climate change could be solved by applying nature-based solutions like FMNR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But only about 5% of the money used for tackling climate change goes into this area. Mm. And when I look at the world, depending on which authority you quote, there are at least 3 billion hectares of degraded land worldwide where you could apply some nature-based solution, FMNR, uh, what's called conservation agriculture, tree planting. There's so many things that we could do quickly and without negative consequences. So I, I guess I'm an optimist. Yes, it's possible to stop climate change, but we have to act decisively and quickly. Yes. And we need hope and we need optimism, right? Yeah. yeah. And we also need activism. Yeah. This is what you're doing. So right. Yeah. Not only an optimist, but also yeah. an activist. So. <laughs> Anything else that is important to you that is close to your heart? So, yes, thank you. And um, it, it touches on some of those things, optimism and hope that you just mentioned. And I, I get to speak 
to around the world, often to young people. And it's very sad to me. I, I see so much sense of hopelessness and despair. People feel it is too late to do anything. And um, I, I came across this quote recently, which is just so, so powerful. And it says, Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. And remember, when I was a little boy, I was angry <laughs> at what was being <laughs> yes. done. <laughs> and I, I think anger is good, but if you just stay there angry, it's no good. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. and the name of the second daughter is courage. Anger at the way things are, courage to not leave them that way. Yeah. And what this quote says to me is that hope doesn't fall out of the sky and land on a selected lucky few. It's not like that. Yeah. You make hope happen by your actions. And so my message is to, to young people, to, to older people too, for that matter, what is it that's in your heart? What makes you angry? For goodness sakes, get up and do something about it, even if it's only one thing, even if it only seems very, very small. Get up and do it, and do it consistently day after day after day and you will make a difference. Yeah. And the wonderful thing about my work, when I look, and you mentioned the millions of hectares, yes, I love seeing the greenery, I love seeing the landscape change, but actually the biggest change that I see when I revisit these communities is the restoration of hope. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very powerful. Yeah. People who'd given up, people who'd stopped trying because everything was hopeless, and they realize the solution is literally at my feet. And I now have the power to create the future that I want for myself and my children. These people are liberated. They have their sense of pride and self-respect restored. And they have hope. Yeah. <laughs> so let's do it. How we can support your work or this work if... Uh, yeah, if people are interested in after this brilliant conversation, thank you so much. Oh, uh, thank you. So, so um, I, I would say, please be informed. And there's lots and lots of information on the web. Um, our own website is fmnr.hub. Uh, H U B. If, if you type in fmnr, you'll find the hub. Lots and lots of information there and stories from around the world. If you're in a position to give, there's a donate button on that website. Mm -hmm. And when, when it takes you to the page, scroll to the bottom, it, it will um, explain how, how to give and what the money goes for. Mm -hmm. So be informed, give. For some people, they may have the gift and they may have the time. Consider if this type of work is for you as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can actually go there and help. In World Vision, like well, in World, World Vision contact. Well, you, you, yeah, you, you need to. World Vision doesn't have a program for experience uh, sharing this way, but I, I'm thinking within your context or within an organisation that does does send people out. C consider this as an option mm -hmm. if if you have that skill set and that yeah that calling in a sense. <laughs> oh. Wow, so well, that was a really, really interesting interview and yeah. I've learned a lot and it's fascinating to see um, your work and to see how it all comes to life, literally. Yeah. And also you, you are really a gift to the world. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it was an honor to have you here with us. Thank you so yeah. much. And we Th wish you all the best for your work. Yeah. And Th we'll thank you. It was a great. Best. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, it was such a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much. This was a conversation with Tony Rinaldo, the forest maker. And I guess we are full of hope right now. And uh, yeah. Something Let's go. Let's go. Let's do it. Thank you so much, dear Tony. <laughs> Th thank you. Mehr Good News gibt's auf www.goodnewsforyou.de 